Good evening, everyone. Um, I would like to share my screen. Thank you, uh, Mudoni, for the intro. I appreciate it. It's it's a blessing to be here. Um, I particularly want to praise God for the opportunity to share. Um, um, God has been extremely kind to me. I I glorify Him. Um, Okay, um, please let's have a word of prayer. Um, I feel butterflies. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I'm grateful for just this opportunity to share what you would like to remind your children, your daughters. I'm praying that you may quicken my mind that your Holy Spirit shall truly imbibe and imbue and um, press upon my mind that which I ought to say. May I decrease and may you be exalted and draw us closer to the cross to behold Christ. In him we pray. Amen. All right. Um, What God says about the single Christian woman, um, I, I must confess that the title did, um, I, I got a little bit um, confused. Um, what the Bible, what God says about the single Christian woman, I thought it was a very theological um, statement about. Um, and so I do pray that God will help me to do justice and quite answer that. Or if I end up saying what God says to the Christian, the single Christian woman, I pray it shall still meet the needs of your heart. All right. Um, I am not single. Um, and truth is, um, I recently got married about three and some years ago um, but I have experienced for a bit um, what it means to be single. I got married much much closer to my 40th year and by Adventist standards that is not right. It's very um, that's late, late, quote unquote. Um, and I, this, this devotion um, sharing is in three parts. Um, in the beginning, identity and the implications. Um, Father, please um, lead my thoughts. Uh, put them aright, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, at the very beginning, at the very beginning, um, God's design at the very beginning, what was it? I will take us to Genesis chapter one. Remember our text is what God says, so we'll definitely be going back to scripture. Um, and if I do overload you with this, please forgive me. It was really the topic that we're addressing. Um, Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So, verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Uh, at the very outset, um, God's design for man and woman was that they would be in his image um, and he did make them as such. I particularly like the quotation in education that says that um, in every human being, um, including the woman, um, they were created in the image of God and they were endowed with a power akin to that of the creator. And what is that power? An individuality, power to think and to do. Um, 
I'm, I'm glad you didn't say it was a power you kind know, of the creator or a power of 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 unionship um of partnership it was a power to that of the creator and individuality that would enable us to both reason and be able to execute that which um we have been able to reason out and so the men or women in whom this power is developed are the women who bear responsibilities, who are leaders in enterprise, and who influence character. So at the very outset, even as we begin this um, presentation, I just like to remind us that in God's divine plan, um, man was not meant to be elevated more supreme, or woman uh, was to be inferior. But he he put in him his intention he put within his dna this this desire this um individuality that is um of his own ability that which christ jesus was able to execute we too can be able to do the same right and that was god's design for us to be like him um and then if you then get to the next chapter in Genesis 2.18, we're told then how um, God made a certain declaration. He said, then God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper for him. I'm glad it is God who discovered that that, that particular, uh, who made that declaration and not Adam himself. Um, and at that point, we then see how God makes a woman. Um, it's interesting how Patrick's and Prophet says, it says that um, when, when Adam had been made, among all the creatures that God had made on the earth, there was not one who was equal to man, and God said it's not good. He made that declaration. And man was, was not made to dwell in solitude. He was to be a social being, right? And, and therefore, um, I, I just want to speak up against this hamit, um, um behaviors where we totally seclude ourselves as women um so that we could be able just to withdraw from society god's desire was for us to then engage with other human beings um and then the same quotation i think the next paragraph says that he was created from the rib of uh, from the rib taken from the side of adam signifying that he was not to control him as a head nor to be trampled under the feet under his feet as an inferior but to stand by his side as an equal to be loved and protected by him and the reason i particularly put that quote is to just remind us perhaps if they're young ladies here women singles who are perhaps in a relationship um or, or perhaps will get into a relationship um god's intention is not for us to be trampled upon to be um, um, put put down um, by this partner. God's intention was that this life partner would then love and protect um, and, and point us to Christ the Savior. Um, so just a caution, should there be a relationship that's ill and does not quite represent what God desired it to be, um, perhaps a needs for reconsideration, all right? Um, I particularly like this section in Genesis 2, 18, and God says it's not good. It's just a reminder that God knows our need. I remember during my singleness thinking, Lord, do you feel me? Um, and I, I wrote that in one of my journals. Um, I have written, um, I started writing journals right from high school, um, and I, even began praying for a life partner while in high school form two i believe right after an elder remind to taught me taught me that it's needful to pray for a spouse beginning that early um that was at age 16. all right so even throughout that singleness journey i i just need to remind us that god truly knows our needs he perceives a thought from afar even before it's upon our tongue he knows it all together all right and and because he knows our need i particularly like how matthew 6 um 6 actually expresses it um, um matthew 6 33 says says um 
Um, I'll, I'll start from verses 31. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. Um, so should you be in doubt about God's ability to perceive your thought? And he, he, he knows it. He's not averse to what you need. Um, and he has the power and ability to meet it. Um, and therefore, uh, I'm, I'm not saying we should not then pray and present our request to the Lord, but we should not be afraid to express our desires to the Lord, our raw passions as they are to him. He, he can deal with our rawest emotions um, and he'll not be, he'll not sleep, um, unlike, unlike man. Um, who, who will not be able either to process it in totality or you'll be judged for how you say it. But God is able to take our emotions as they are. All right. And, and thereafter, we see then in Genesis 2, how then God first had made the man in Genesis 2, 7. Um, and I particularly, the reason I wanted to emphasize this is to remind us that um, when, when, when God bows down, um, and, and takes this soil of the earth and shapes man and puts this soil and pieces together and bends down to breathe upon him. And man becomes a living soul. Adam wakes up and, and the first person he sees, sorry, um, um, wrong phone, um, wrong place. Um, how do you even put this thing on silent? Uh, hey, um, do not disturb. Okay. Um, and so when, when Adam wakes up and he beholds his creator and has this encounter with his creator, um, and I believe likewise the same for Eve, as God took the rib out and then shapes this bone and makes Eve, when she then becomes a living uh, being. Um, the first person she then encounters is Christ the Savior. Um, and I would really like to emphasize that God truly desires, first and foremost, primarily, he desires to have a relationship with him, to know him deeply and intimately. You can imagine God kissing down and blowing into his mouth. Such a close intimacy God desires with us. And he desires that relationship outside of any other human being. All right. So I, I like Isaiah 55, 6. It says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call out upon him while he is near. And truth is, while you are seeking God, his eyes is roaming. He's wondering who is searching out for me, who's looking out for me. Um, call upon me when he's near. And I particularly like a text a few verses later, a chapter later says that even before we speak, even before we um, uh, make known our thoughts, the Lord knows, perceives, he understands. Um, and, and so emphasizing then the need for us as single Christian women, what God is as of us as first and foremost is to have an intimate, personal, personal relationship with him outside of our parents, outside of um, um, potential future spouse, outside of um, um, any other relationship, others it shall be uh, that, that, that being, that other element then shall then become an idol. But God desires to be fast, last, and best, all right? Which then we do know then um, sin happened and man fell short and, and Christ then had to come and demonstrate to us who we are, to remind us who we are, because we totally lost ourselves. Um, and, and the reason I, I speak to this is because I think as women, we tend to look for identity in so many other things. We have this misplaced identity um, because our identity is not, it's, it's definitely not what we do. Um, it's, it's not defined by my career. And I must say, I find a lot of, I used to, I probably still do. Okay, God had to sort me out on that one. But I find a lot of um, 
um, joy and contentment, satisfaction in, in that which I do. But there was a time I that was really shaken and I really had to reevaluate then what is my identity because it's not what I do. And um, I, I got a terrible, terrible, terrible emotion. Um, of course, that really shook me a bit because uh, I had to then begin to reevaluate who am I? What am I? Am I good enough? Okay. And the problem with having identity in what we do is if we're doing well, there's pride. And if we do terribly or if we fail, then there is shame that comes with it. Now, identity is also not what we love. It's it's not that um that handbag, um, that um degree, it's not that significant other, it's not your parents, it's not that hobby. All right. The reason is it could lead to disappointment in this thing that we love. Um, they may, it may not satisfy you and therefore be disappointed. It's not how we look like, uh, ladies. Um, I know some of us perhaps may be struggling with our um, weight issues, um, our physical appearance. I must say, I struggled a bit um, about my teeth for the longest time. They are uh, discolored. Um, and for a bit that I couldn't smile much. Um, hmm, hmm. Uh, uh, there's a lot of esteem issues that came along with that. Um, and so there was all this question about, do we polish them? Do we, will it cost us too much? Anyway, uh, our identity is not what we look like. Um, weight, physical appearance, our, our, our identity is equally not what is our current season in life. And right now, you may be called the single. But the thing is, that will pass. Um, uh, you, you, you may be known as the widow. Um, at some point, should the Lord then bless you, you become a mother, but that will change. You become an empty nester. Then what then happens to you? Um, and, and it's not equally, I'm thinking of that person who probably has been declared to have a terminal illness. Uh, the probably ladies struggling with endometriosis. Um, that 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 disease should not not become your identity or what you identify yourself to be or this disability. Neither is it this personality thing or a hidden strength that you have. Um, and it's not what others have said about us. And I think we do take a lot of what people tell us um, internally and and internalize it. Truth is. They don't have all the truth. They don't see the whole picture as God has, all right? So this misplaced identity, the, the thing with placing identity in any of these things, because these things are temporary, uh, totally. Um, and it's not that which God would have us to establish or put our identity, because it will result most likely in pride or shame or disappointment or insufficiency, not feeling enough. Um, and I don't know if you've ever been in circumstances, or you probably are in circumstances where you're feeling, I'm not, I'm not sufficient for these things, um, possibly because you have placed your identity in all those things. So then what should we place our identity on? Um, our identity should then be based on something that's eternal, that's unchanging, that's um, supernal, that's irreversible, and that is in Christ Jesus. I, I particularly like, after all the descriptive things in Hebrews, there's such a punchline in Hebrews 13, 8, that simply says, it speaks to my heart. Um, um, Hebrews 13, verse 8, it says, do not be carried away, verse, that's verse 9, verse 8, um, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, all right? That unchanging Christ, Christ who's unchanging and eternal, him is to whom we should have a union and an identity in. Christ then becomes our standard. He, in, in my weakness, he becomes my strength. In my insufficiency, he becomes my fullness or sufficiency. He then makes me complete. I particularly like, and I had to constantly remind myself this in, when in my singlehood, um, in Colossians 2.10, uh, potent promise that I think, any 
any any person, any single woman should be running with Colossians 2 verses 10 says, and you have been given fullness in Christ. Another version says, in him you are complete. Though oftentimes, I guess in my Christian journey, I felt um, I, I needed a, another being. I needed a spouse. I needed this um, uh, pe pe spouse to then make me complete, to then be able to do the things God was calling me to do. But every time this text would come to mind, and Christ is saying, Janet, thou art full in me. You are complete in me, and I desire you to do the things I, I have put in your heart to do, to go and fulfill them, because I am making you complete. And do not change yourself on the basis that, oh, I shall wait for this life partner to then do one, two, three things. In Christ, we are being reminded that we have the fullness in him. I, I'd like us to think, what were we without Christ? Um, what were we without Christ Jesus? Um, and, and this, you can read Romans from chapter 3 to chapter 8. This is where I picked this out. Without Christ, we were sinners were shot. Um, allow me to say this. Even as I was speaking about what God says to the single Christian woman, this can apply to really any Christian. But I really just like to remind us who we are in Christ as a single woman. Without him, we were sinners who were short of his glory, who were enemies of God. Um, we were to receive the wrath of God, uh, who were disobedient, condemned, slaves to sin, dead in sin. And, and, and that's what we were in Christ, truly lost of ourselves, truly. Without Christ, without Christ, we are lost, lost, like gone. Like what would we be? Collusion says that in him all things consist. Um, there was a time in school while doing my studies. Uh, now research is not my thing, but I felt like my brain was disintegrating. Um, and, and, and then I just remembered the text that says, Janet, in him all things consist, including your brain cells. Um, and the reason I remember that is because I once saw an accident where somebody's skull burst open and I saw brain matter. Um, and I was like, Lord, please hold, hold this brain cells together. Christ has the power to then consist and hold us together and put us together. Even when we're feeling like we're shambles and breaking out, Christ has a power then to consist and hold us together. Um, um, row Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians, I must tell you, is one of my favorite books um, because it really reinforces who I am in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 4, verse 6 says, um, but because of his great love, but God in his great love for us, who was rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ when we were dead, we were dead to feelings, we were dead to hope, we were dead in sin. But it is by grace that you have been saved. And then we have been raised up with Christ and seated with, and he has enabled us to sit with him in heavenly um, realms in Christ Jesus. Um, so that's what we were without Christ. What, who then do we become as a result of this union with Christ Jesus? And I'll refer to Ephesians chapter 1. Um, and, and this were all picked up from Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, allow me to walk through with you. I'm going to go from verses 3. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. So in Christ, we are blessed young ladies, single ladies. Um, he has blessed us in heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. And that includes given to us single people who at times feel we are not as gifted. We don't have the abilities. How can I? Should I? Should I not? Ephesians 1.3 then says, every spiritual blessing in Christ has been granted to us. Then verse 4 says, in Christ we are chosen, handpicked, selected out. I used to wonder, Lord, out of this verse, all these gentlemen who come passing by, Lord, can any of them just see me? 
Can't I be just be handpicked? But reminded in Christ Jesus, he has chosen us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless. Praise his name. Praise his name. Um, it's, it's his desire to purify us and to cleanse us and to make us whole and new in him. And then verses 5 goes on. He predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Christ Jesus. And I know at times, I, I, I don't know what it means to not be without a father. Um, but when I read about being adopted, I think of those without parents. Um, and imagine the whole the whole experience that comes with adoption or being owned again and loved yet again and being having an identity or a root, um, having a family, um, one whom I could call father, adopted, adopted, adopted in Christ Jesus, um, according with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Then what did he do? In him, Christ Jesus, what are we? We are redeemed. We are redeemed and forgiven. Um, and I do need to remind us, ladies, that I don't know what your past experience has been, but to remind us that Christ has forgiven us. He takes us as we are and cleanses us and makes us pure and spotless. He imputes to us his righteousness. And therefore, when the father looks upon us, he sees his daughter, his son, made pure and white with the very righteousness of Christ. Um, and I particularly need to emphasize that because I don't know what your experience has been, what guilt you bear, but reminding us that in Christ we are forgiven and redeemed um friend of mine likes song hymn number 338 that says redeemed how i love to proclaim it redeemed through his infinite mercy his child and forever i am his daughter i am forever and and the accuser of our brethren will try and convince us that we're not worthy that we have sinned so far gone so so deep in sin that we cannot be cleansed and purified of him but remember in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Um, I particularly like verses 8, um, that unto us has been lavish, you know, like poured out this in abundance um, of all wisdom. And truth is, we do need a lot of wisdom to live in this day and this age and in this time. Um, and, and just remembering um, speak, yesterday's conversation about finance and investment, God is able to give us a single woman the wisdom we need on what to invest in and how. He's able to abound it to us. And not just for investment, but in every other sphere of life, God is willing and ready to grant us the wisdom that we so need. And it's no, 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 no. It's not dependent on, on a partnership with anybody else, but to you as an individuality. Remember, he blessed us with a power akin of that of a creator, individuality. Then he goes on to say in verses 11, that in him we obtained an inheritance. Praise Jesus. I must say here, um, I once asked my father, Mr. Yende, um, for an inheritance. Um, culturally, that is a taboo, terrible taboo. Um, but um, truth is, I, uh, it was made clear to me that a uh, woman um, in our culture does not get an inheritance. That was painful, really painful. Um, uh, perhaps some of you are more privileged than I. Um, but Ephesians 1, 11, in him, in him, we have been um, chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything according to the conformity of his purpose and will in order that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of glory. 
Um, another version says, in him we have obtained this inheritance. Um, we have an inheritance. And I particularly like the, like the emphasis in verse 13 and 14 that says that in Christ, when we had the word of truth, having believed, we were sealed with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit. And what does that do? It's a guarantee. It's, it's a stamp saying, check, check. This person has been checked. They're going to access heaven and eternity. Um, and, and that's granted to us. Um, there's a guarantee of our inheritance, ladies. The Holy Spirit. I need to say this, it wasn't in the someone, but the Holy Spirit, when we ask of him every single time, he, he is a seal. How do I say this? How do I say this? How do I say it? It's like your passport. It's like it's it's like your key to enter into heaven. And therefore, just though I need for constantly asking for the imbued abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. That that can be your experience every day to have the Holy Spirit feeling your life. And therefore asking of you every day, Lord, feel me, fill me now with your Holy Spirit. Now, uh, forgive me that I've gone that long over that. But let me give you the implications of what I have just said. It then means, if we are then finding our eternity in Christ, it then means that we shall not be ashamed. There was a year that I'd claim a certain text in Psalms that says, Lord, I shall not be put to shame. Because several people kept asking me, Janet, are you going to get married? Janet, uh -huh. Lord, your name is at stake. And it's likely that until some of us have been gifted with singleness, and that is okay. There are those who have been gifted with singleness. But I would go to the Father and say, Lord, I've got too much love inside me. Help me. I need to pour it. Anyway, I did get into the marriage and I figured out maybe I'm not, it's not love. It's, it's, it's very selfish, selfish desires, truly selfish. Um, but so, so, um, this not ashamed is picked up from Romans chapter 5. What God tells a Christian woman, um, Romans chapter 5 gives us a ladder of that which we are in Christ. Therefore, because we've been justified in Christ, we have peace with God. We have access to all this grace in him. And because of that, we will rejoice in hope. And I know that there are some of us perhaps who have given up hope, have despaired in the poss any possibility of ever suckling. Um, let us rejoice in hope, all right? And this hope does not make ashamed. I could have jumped the gun. Uh, this is me in Romans chapter 5. We have gained access by faith into this grace, which is now we stand, and we rejoice in the hope and the glory of God. Not only so, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Now, some of us perceive our singleness as suffering. However, Romans 5, 3 reminds us that we shall rejoice in this experience, experience. And because this, this experience will then produce perseverance and perseverance character. Reach a point, by the way, in this Christian journey, it's like, Lord, wherever you want us to go, we will go. I shall, I shall, I shall, I shall ride this train with you, dear Lord. And I want this experience to be a blessing, so help it be a blessing. And then it goes on to say it produces perseverance and character, and character does not, and hope, character, hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured lavishly upon our hearts. He's filled our hearts with love. And therefore, when we know who we are in Christ Jesus, my friends, we shall not be ashamed. We shall be walking with our heads held up high, even in that crowd who are thinking, mm-hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Who are thinking that we are lesser or shorter, but we shall be able to walk in Christ and ashamed and engage in every activity that God has called us to do. All right. Um, in this single state, we are not ashamed. The other implication is then, therefore, we shall be content because. Because of what and who Christ Jesus then has then called us to be, we shall then be able to be content with the things he has put in our hearts. Why? Because there's peace. Because we have been justified, he then gives us peace with God. And truth is, we can have a peace. And that peace can bring contentment. Contentment in the 
position or in the state that we are in. Um, and I particularly like the promise attached to that reason why we should be content because he himself has said, Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I, I recognize that at the very beginning, God had said, it is not good for man to be. Um, but even God could have not have met Adam's need at the time. But, but for the state, the position, the place God has, he has the ability and the power to sustain you even in that state. For a while, I don't know how long, Adam was old. I mean, he was naming the animals, he was put in the garden, he was told what to do, he was given the commandment for a while. Adam really was a single man, he was. And in that state, he did find contentment. He was, until God declared, okay, let's make somebody. And like as Eve, I believe, was content in the presence of Christ. Until then, God brought them then together. All right, so two whole beings then, two content human beings then uh, were joined as one. Um, and therefore, uh, when we then become content in Christ, and truly it is a gift of Christ, he is willing and able to give it to you too. Um, he will then be able to enable you to deal with the internal pressure you perhaps feel. I need to get married. Or the societal expectation of you should get married. Um, um, I, I do need to say that we will then perceive the singleness then as a gift. And I particularly like how Paul writes it. He says, to the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. Um, I believe, um, if, if, you, if you read, um, um, forgive me, I didn't put this verse, um, Jesus Christ saying that unto some they are made to be eunuchs. Um, to, to some from birth, they do not have any desire to get married. And that is okay. It is a gift of Christ Jesus. Praise his name. Even marriage, I do suppose, that is also a gift. But even itself, marriage is a gift. Um, I mean, singleness is a gift. And what does God then require of us with two minutes to go? What does then, then God require us to do with this gift? To return it back to him as an offering of everything that God has given unto us. He gives to us that we may return it back to him and he returns it back to us purified and sanctified. All right. And, and Romans 12 to says we should present ourselves as a living, holy sacrifice. And therefore, even the singleness, God can then use it to be as a gift to many others with whom you engage. We need to begin seeing ourselves and offering, Lord, I give you back the singleness. What do I do with it? I remember the testimony of Elizabeth Elliot. Um, uh, wife to Jim Elliot, a missionary back in South America. When her husband died, she began to look at her widowhood as, as a gift and present it back to the Lord. And God did use it for his glory. So everything that God gives us, everything, everything, including the singleness, then ought to be returned back to him as a gift. All right. Now, the other implication is then we then need to be fruitful as a result of this union in Christ Jesus. For um, John 14 um, and 15, John 15 in particular says that if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall be able to bear much fruit. It's a union with Christ. And therefore, even in our singleness, God does require us to bear much fruit. And, and, and he may prune, he may prune, he may hurt. And, and particularly, um, remember the text in Genesis 128 when he made this Adam and Eve, woman and man, his desire, he told them to be fruitful, multiply, replenish. And in my singleness, the question is, how do I be fruitful? And it, we don't need to look at it in the context of procreation. No, no, no. But in my, in my workplace, in my professional life, in my family life at home, my parents, my siblings, how then can I be able to bear much fruit? How can I multiply? Um, how can I increase fruit? Uh, Lord, where do you want me to refill and to replenish in church? Um, how, Lord, where do you want me? What traits, Lord, do you want to subdue in me? What do you want to me to become? All right. So a life of fruitfulness, God does require it of us. All right. Now, 
just promises to live by um that to remind us that god actually does keep his promise uh, i particularly remember mary she says lord be it unto me as you have said i have believed your word and we need to take God at his word. He's not man that he should lie. All right. Two ladies, not comparing ourselves one to another. Um, because charm and beauty is deceptive. And therefore, when we look at others, ah, ah, the thing we need to do is to fear the Lord. Um, she shall be praised. Please remember to trust in God's timing because, because in every um, there's an occasion for everything in the fullness of time. Even Christ was born in the fullness of time. Um, please remember that God also uses the singles. I remember the text in Acts 21 verse 9, speaking of the daughters of Philip, the evangelist. It was all that he, he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied and were used of God. Um, um, God is, God is, God is God, ladies. God is God. He is not taken by surprise. He's not, he, he didn't he did make you and then forget you. He hasn't forgotten you. He's, he's made you where you are right now is the place he wants you to be right now. All right. And that's in Esther 4, 14, that God has made you for such a time as this, created for this time, at the place where you are at this time. Um, so, and then, uh, please, thou shall not be desperate, right? Um, Songs of Solomon. Do not stop love um, um don't don't affix yourself to a man that is not uh, uh that god didn't bring you to all right don't you affix yourself to it please remember that god has called us not to depend on feelings but on faith i, I particularly like this quote it stood out for me as i was reading it in fundamentals of christian education but faith, let me read it from the start. All things are possible with God, all things. And by faith, we may lay hold on his power, power to remain pure and chaste in mind, power to remain single in our state, power to be rejoicing in our state, power to be, to, to be fruitful even in the state. But faith is not sight. Faith is not feeling. Faith is not reality. Ha! Huh. Faith is not reality, ah, potent. Ah, let me speed these things. And then faith is to rely entirely, to trust God implicitly upon his faithfulness. Um, and I know it's quite possible. I reached there several times in my single journey um, where I began to doubt God's goodness. Um, but, but, God is good, ladies. God is good. Um, and his purposes for you are high and lofty and good. Trust him. Please go back to your word. I barely said a tip of everything that God has said to single women. Um, the end goal, ladies, at the end of the day, what God truly desires us to be is to be Christ-like. I pray maybe your experience, whether you get married or not, I pray he'll make you fruitful, he'll make you abound and content and at rest in him. God bless you. All right, let's pray. Channel Father, we are grateful that you have made us and that you've called us to be your daughters in Christ Jesus. I pray that you may root us, establish us in this truth of who we are in you. And then, Lord, I pray, send us forth with power that we may be able to declare your marvelous light and be a light that is set upon a hill that bears much fruit for your kingdom. Thank you. Keep us in you. Keep us faithful until you come again or until you allow us to rest. This is a humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.